Inside America's Boardrooms, the informational show for board members and corporate secretaries. Brought to you with knowledge partners, NASDAQ, the Center for Audit Quality, and PwC. Along with content contributors, Equilar, Meridian Compensation Partners, Wilson Sonsini Goodridge and Rosati, Donnelly Financial Solutions, and the Society for Corporate Governance. Welcome to this edition of Inside America's Boardrooms. I'm T.K. Kerstetter, the CEO of Boardroom Resources, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the show. Today we're going to be talking about Sarbanes-Oxley, and we're coming up on its 15th anniversary. Yeah, 15 years have already passed since Sarbanes-Oxley. And joining me to talk about this important anniversary is Cindy Fernelli, who is the Executive Director for the Center of Audit Quality. Cindy, welcome back. Thank you, TK. It's a pleasure to be here as always. So, I know you're as surprised as I am that 15 years has passed. I can remember sitting and talking about the impacts of what this will be, but it's been 15 years. So, it was enacted to foster uh, reliable financial reporting, improved audit quality, et cetera, et cetera. So, as you reflect back on the 15 years, what do you think have been the primary impacts of Sarbanes-Oxley? Well, you know, it was a very targeted piece of legislation, but it also was very broad in its scope. So the one thing I would focus in on today, since we're here talking to boards of directors, is the impacts that it had and the uh, obligations that it imposed on boards of directors, particularly uh, mandating that there be an independent audit committee and that that independent audit committee oversee the entire financial reporting process. I think that was a big change. I think it brought a lot of confidence into the system by investors. And I think that there were things that followed on to that, like having an audit committee financial expert or else disclosing why you don't. And we have data now that shows that most boards of directors have not one, but more than one audit committee financial expert. So to me, that was a big piece of the legislation that brought about confidence uh, to investors and to the marketplace. So um, the CAQ has often expressed support of uh, the value that uh, Sarbanes-Oxley has brought, uh, particularly in the sense of audit quality, okay, which is sort of in our your, your bag, <laughs> as they say. So, Share with me why you're so confident that you can make that statement that it's so valued. Well, obviously, I think that there's been a lot of investment by audit firms and accounting firms, by regulators, uh, by companies and management to foster audit quality and to bring to life the tenants of Sarbanes-Oxley. But it's not just a feeling that I have or a sense that I have. We actually have data that we've acquired over the last 15 years that are indicators of audit quality and that do show that audit quality has improved if you buy that these are indeed indicators of audit quality. So one of them is the number of restatements. Audit Analytics has done independent research and has shown since 2002 the number of financial restatements has declined steadily. Uh, over the last 15 years. So I take that as a form of audit quality or an indicator of audit quality. We also at the CAQ go out and talk to Main Street investors. So since the CAQ's inception in 2007, we have every year talked to what we call Main Street investors, the men and women on the street who invest in our capital markets. And over that 10-year period, their confidence in audited financial statements, in U.S. publicly traded companies, as well as those who look out for their interests, the independent auditors, is very high and imp has improved over the last 10 years. So I take that too as solid data or empirical evidence that the investments that regulators, companies, and the audit firms have made is working. And that's all under the guise of Sarbanes-Oxley, some of the reforms that Sarbanes-Oxley imposed upon the system. Well, I can offer you additional support um, in the previous governance work that I did. I remember when the law came out, the board members really did not like it. I mean, I, we did, a, we did a, some uh, surveys, 
And I think a lot of it was due to 404, the complexity of 404. Yeah. But there was like a 80% felt that this was really bad legislation and whatever. Five years later, okay, that number turned around completely. The board members themselves was somewhere close to 70% felt that the legislation was good legislation. I'll bet you if you asked them today, it would be closer to 85. You know? Well, we asked not board members, but just this um, past month, we asked CFOs, chief financial officers, specifically about what they felt about 404B, uh, which is often the, as you said, the provision that people cite to as being critical. And 79% of the CFOs that uh, we had uh, an independent consulting firm go out and interview said that they believe Sarbanes-Oxley, specifically 404B, has improved the quality of information in audited financial statements. So well, there you are, go. Right, and 82% of financial advisors said the same thing. Yeah. So again, another piece of empirical data that shows that it uh, indeed is working. Yeah, and, and in the 30,000 feet view, the board members the, the legislation reminded board members of their responsibilities. I mean, that's, that's right. It really, codified it, if yeah. you will. So what is really interesting to note with the time we have left was the vote on Sarbanes-Oxley in the Senate was 99 to 0. Zero to okay. goose egg. <laughs> now, with all that we've seen <laughs> since the last 15 years, can you imagine, first of all, that there's that bipartisan support, and second of all, the significance of that overwhelming, do you think we would ever see it? Today? It's hard to say, and I might also point out that on the House, only three um, of the congressmen voted against it. So on that vote, a total of 522 congresspeople voted and only three voted against it. That is remarkable. I can't imagine that happening today. One thing I think is that the legislation was fairly targeted as we started out talking about. It was a fairly focused piece of legislation and having spent nearly 30 years in Washington, uh, that's rare that you see a piece of legislation that is very narrow in its scope. So that could be a reason why it enjoyed such bipartisan support. Remember too, we were off of the front pages with Enron and WorldCom. People were um, upset. Uh, Confidence was low. Yeah, legislators knew that this was a this was a no-brainer from yeah. a constituency perspective. Yeah. Okay, yeah. but still, even it's knowing pretty that, pretty remarkable. Pretty remarkable. It really is. Today. Well, as always, I appreciate you stopping in. Again, this had a significant effect on your organization in the sense of um, gave you this mission and this charge to really lift the markets. You just celebrated your 10th anniversary, did, which was indeed. very special. Um, and I must say, you guys have certainly done your part to improve investor confidence in the capital market. So congratulations to the CAQ. Thank you, TK. Yeah. So um, first of all, Cindy, thanks for joining My me pleasure. again. My pleasure. And that will conclude this edition of Inside America's Boardroom. We hope you enjoyed the show. We'll be back again next week when we take a look at another critical topic that'll help you be a better board member or committee member. So we'll see you then. Join us again next week for Inside America's Boardrooms, brought to you with Knowledge Partners, NASDAQ, the Center for Audit Quality, and PwC, along with content contributors, Equilar, Meridian Compensation Partners, Wilson, Sonsini, Goodridge, and Rosati, Donnelly Financial Solutions, and the Society for Corporate Governance.